I'm going to ask that you take your Bibles now and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4. Uh, very rarely do I connect with the music team in terms of song choices and things like that. Uh, I kind of like getting surprised on a Sunday morning. <laughs> and so that's usually what we do. And it's very interesting. The songs they were singing today fit so well with where we are headed in First Thessalonians. So thank you for preparing our hearts that way. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as others who, do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet, sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. A little bit ago, the church board met with the pastor to discuss his salary for the upcoming year. And at that meeting, the board chairman turned to the pastor and said, We are very sorry, pastor. We decided that we cannot give you a raise next year. But you must give me a raise, protested the pastor. I am but a poor preacher. And they responded saying, yes, we know. We hear you preach every Sunday. <laughs> okay, think about what was just said there. You'll get it. Uh, <laughs> I trust today will be better. <laughs> but anyway, let's have a word of prayer as we turn to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can gather, that we can discuss your word, and that your word has such a, a strong impact in our lives, even to this very day. And even as we turn to your word this morning, we ask that your spirit would be at work that our hearts and our minds would be quickened to understand that which you would have for us, that we would truly grasp how blessed it is to be a believer and to be part of the family of God. We ask, Lord, that you would take away all the many distractions that are plaguing our hearts and our minds right now and just allow us to come to your word and saturate our soul with what you have written. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, uh, the first time I became acquainted with intense grief was when I was around 12 years of age and one of my best friends, a teenager, died with cystic fibrosis. That's a degenerative lung disease. I came to the funeral, and of course, coming from a small town, the funeral was held in the hall, and it seemed like the entire town showed up for this young man's funeral. And as I approached the entrance, the usher asked if I would like to approach the casket at the front and see my dead friend's body. And I said no. See, I grew up on a farm, and we had farm animals. These farm animals died quite regularly, but this was different. I did not want to see my friend's lifeless body in the casket and cry. I did not want to cry in front of the entire town. Everybody was on the same page that day because 
In that moment, we all realized there would be no more time spent together. There would be no more jokes. Our friendship was severed. And we were all grieving because with death, it brings an unyielding separation. Usually we say goodbye knowing that we would say hello. But in this case, we would be saying goodbye and we would not be saying hello again. Grief shows that we love deeply. How many times has it been at a funeral that God has been sought in the quietness of your own heart where you're saying to the Lord in a quiet prayer, Lord, can you please just bring them back? We miss them. We're hurting. But the separation that occurs at death isn't God's fault. It's our fault. Adam and Eve, when they decided to live their lives independent of God, that's when we became acquainted with death. Death was never God's intention nor His plan. And so we know grief. Grief at the death of a loved one is normal. We're showing that things are not okay. I've been at many funerals where somebody says, Boy, they did well. What they meant was they didn't show any grief. That's not good. Grief shows that you deeply love someone, and grief shows that something's not okay. Oh, it is okay to grieve, but what isn't okay is unnecessary grief. Unnecessary grieving is unnecessary. Grieve because the death of a loved one brings separation. Grieve it's okay to be sad. But what's not okay is for a believer in Christ to grieve without confidence. You know, God has not revealed much about the future to us, but of what He has revealed to us allows us to grieve with confidence. Some might think that all they need is Jesus. And that's true. If you want forgiveness of your sins and you want eternal life and you want the guarantee of eternity with God, all you need is Jesus and believing in His death on the cross. But if you want to grieve with confidence, you need more than just Jesus. You need to be informed. And being informed about what God says in the Bible will affect you every day. Less is not more when it comes to Bible study. You want to know here what God's Word says about the future, and it will allow you to grieve. Unlike those in our world, you will be able to grieve with confidence. What God says is it is okay to grieve, but do not unnecessarily grieve and he is about to inform you about what will take place in the future so that when you do grieve you grieve confidently first Thessalonians in chapter 4 and verses 13 and 14 says but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep there it's talking about people who have died that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even, though, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And you'll notice here, there's a word in the verses that we're going through this morning. It's a repeated word. It happens six or seven times. It's the English word, will. This will happen. You can be confident because this will take place. What will happen to believers in Christ who have already died? That was their question. 
by this time they were taught and everybody knew that Jesus was coming back, they thought that Jesus' return would be immediate. They expected that when Jesus returned that he would come and set up his earthly kingdom and when he would do so, every believer in Christ would be part of his kingdom administration. It was just a given. Jesus is coming back as king and when he comes back, we're going to be part of his kingdom. Everyone was excited until the first of them died. And then the second, and then the third, and then the fourth. And now they had this burning question. They said, what will happen to them? We didn't expect anybody to die before Jesus came back. And the answer is, this is what will happen Yes, grieve, but do not unnecessarily grieve. Grieve with confidence. Yes, death brings separation, but no, this is what will happen. As the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again, Deceased believers in Christ will also rise again. Grieve with confidence. When we grieve over the death of a believer in Christ, we, our grief will ultimately be temporary. We can be confident that our grief will be temporary because if Jesus did it before, He can do it again. When Jesus came to Lazarus' funeral, it was the only time in Scripture that Jesus came to a funeral that I'm aware of that he turned the funeral into a celebration. He rose Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days, and everybody could see there he was dead, and now he's alive. And he turned that funeral into a party. And even Jesus' own opponents admitted that Jesus raised Lazarus to life. And if Jesus, with one single word, can raise Lazarus from the dead, if he did it before, he can do it again. Even in death, God does not abandon believers in Christ. You do not need to unnecessarily grieve. You can grieve with confidence. Because Jesus, if He doesn't abandon you in death, He won't abandon you in life either. This will occur. Because Pastor Jonathan says so? <laughs> nope. This will occur. Because Paul, Timothy, and Silas, who wrote the letters of 1 Thessalonians, said we have received a word directly from Christ that this is how it will take place. You will be able to grieve confidently because Jesus himself gave us this information. But they were still wondering now, if deceased believers in Christ are going to come back to life, when will they come back to life? In a thousand years? In ten thousand years? When? When? And they said, this is what Jesus revealed to us. In verses 14 and 15, they continue saying, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet, sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This will happen. And if you notice very carefully here, he says, we who are alive when this takes place. Notice what he just said there? We who are alive. Not you who are alive. Paul, Timothy, and Silas are writing this letter, and they're saying, we who are alive. There's a lot of people who like to set dates for Jesus' second coming, and if you notice something interesting, when they do so, they usually set the coming, his second coming, when they're 
a little, quite a bit older. Look throughout history and you'll find people that set the date for Jesus' coming to be towards the end of their expected life. It's when they've already lived their life to the full, when they've gotten married, when they've had their kids and they've seen their grandkids and they've been at graduations and they've been at their, at their own grandchildren's weddings. And then they say, now is when Jesus is coming back. But not Paul, Timothy, or Silas. Paul, Timothy, and Silas knew it was possible that Jesus would come back during their lifetime. Not towards the end of their life. Anytime. They were living expecting Jesus' second coming. They didn't know when he would return. But they knew his return could be any time. And so they said, we who are alive when he returns, meaning it could be us. Paul, Timothy, Silas, they thought they might be alive by the time Jesus comes back. In other words, they believed in the imminent second coming. There's nothing stopping Jesus from coming right now until God the Father says it's time. Go. And if you want to grieve with confidence... You need to adopt a point of view that says Jesus can come back at any time and He might not come back in my lifetime. We need to live this way and when you live this way, you can grieve confidently because in this passage it says when He comes back, whether you're alive or whether you're not alive, when He comes back, when Jesus returns, the first ones to meet Jesus at His second coming will be deceased believers. Deceased believers will be resurrected, and then alive believers will meet with Christ. There will be a trumpet sound, and in the Old Testament there was a variety of feasts, and the, the sound of the trumpet marked the beginning of the feast. The feast was a celebration, and here when it says there will be a trumpet sound, it's marking the beginning of a really, really great celebration that's about to take place. It says this will take place coinciding with the call of an archangel. An archangel was the highest in rank among all the angels. And we're supposing here that he's saying the archangel will be speaking and kicking off this event because as an archangel is the highest of all angels, he's saying this is not just a common event. This is going to be a spectacular, glorious event. It will be a celebration and this will happen, and it will be an event unlike any other. You know, we're not told what, the, what existence is like after we die. We're not told about the intermediate period, about what happens when the believer in Christ dies, and what happens in between his resurrection. We're not told if it's only the believers in Christ who will be hearing the trumpet, or if all the whole world will be hearing the trumpet. But what we're told is this. Deceased believers in Christ will rise first. You know, as a child, I remember being told that we're going swimming. We didn't go swimming all that often as a family. But when we were told we're going swimming, the anticipation, the excitement, it was almost unbearable. And when it comes to the death of a believer in Christ, we're instructed here that you can grieve with confidence because you are not only going to see the powerful, the glorious, the exalted, the magnificent, Jesus Christ. You're going to see every believer in Christ resurrected it will be kicked off with a trumpet because it will be a party and in verse 17 it says then we who are alive we who are left 
will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will forever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And you notice the re word is repeated again and again. This will happen. Deceased believers in Christ will meet Jesus first. And alive believers in Christ will meet Jesus second. If you compare with what's being said here with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it appears this will take place incredibly fast. 1 Corinthians 15 says the reception of our glorified bodies will be taking place in the twinkling of an eye and will be met, caught up together to meet Christ in the clouds in the twinkling of an eye. This is going to take place so quickly. And a friend of me asked one day, do you believe in the rapture? And the way they asked the question was like this, you don't believe in the rapture now, do you? And they said right away, you know, the word rapture never occurs in the Bible. You don't believe in the rapture, do you? Well, the word caught up occurs in the Bible. And when the Bible was translated into Latin, they translated the Greek words caught up into the Latin word rapturo. And when they translated the Bible from Latin into English, they made a brand new English word translating or transliterating the Greek or the Latin word rapturo into a word called rapture. But if you would translate the word in Greek, caught up, you wouldn't translate it rapture, you would translate it caught up. And if you would ask me, do you believe in the rapture? I'd say, as a believer in Christ, knowing this is what's going to happen, I believe I'm going to get caught up. To be caught up means to be snatched away. It's used a number of times in Scripture to describe an involuntary moment where somebody snatches something away. In other words, you will not have a choice in this. When Jesus comes back in a twinkling of an eye, it's going to be a forever moment that will change your existence. The Lord Jesus will come, and in an instant you'll be in his presence. But more than that, you'll know in that moment your grief is temporary. The death of a loved one brings a separation, and that separation is not okay, and that's why we grieve. But do not unnecessarily grieve. Grieve with confidence. And because this is what will happen, we're instructed here, we're commanded here to do something to, for one another. We're to give the grieving encouragement because of what will happen. Maybe the encouragement that you give will go something like this. You know, God did not forget about deceased believers in Christ because he will resurrect them first. Maybe the encouragement you'll give to a grieving brother or sister in Christ will go something like this. Grieving over the loss of a fellow believer in Christ is okay, but your grief will be temporary. Maybe your encouragement will go something like this. You know, we're all invited to a party. And it's going to be a great party. Maybe your encouragement will go something like this. When we hear the invitation to that party, we're not just going to see deceased believers that we know and love. We're going to see every single deceased Believer in Christ. 
And maybe your encouragement will go something like this. If Jesus did it before, he'll do it again. We have something to look forward to as believers in Christ. We have a day that we're invited to a glorious party. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, the longer we live, the more we become acquainted with grief. We all know loved ones who have gone on before, who have believed in your Son. And yet, Lord, I'm sort of crying right now because I know I'm going to see him again. As a believer in Christ, our experience right now is temporary, and we're so grateful for that. So grateful that the reuniting that takes place at that trumpet call is going to be so glorious. Just to see Jesus, it will be so wonderful. But we're going to see so many more than just Jesus. Lord, I just want to praise you that with a little bit of knowledge from your word, it lifts so many burdens. And so thank you for caring for every one of us in this moment and letting us know about the bright and glorious future that we can anticipate. Help us to encourage one another with these words. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.